Hello, I'm Bill Horton, and uh, today we're going to continue our series of Vietnam Insane Asylum. And today we're going to talk about Ashau Valley. Now, for my friends out there, one of the things that I want you to do right now is I want you to think in your own mind of what would cause you a horrible feeling of dread. What would give you the most feeling of anxiety? I want you to understand, my friends, that Ashau Valley was not just merely a location, but it was also an emotion for many, many people that served there. Now, this emotion wasn't just among the Americans that served there. It was also in the training areas uh, back in uh, the United States. It was also among the South Vietnamese people. Ashau was always seen as a place of mystery. And it was a place of horror and a place of dread. Now, uh, I'll get more into this because I'm going to talk about the weather in Ashau, which is very, very particular and will give you also that feeling of dread. Because in those fog shrouded hills, it was just a sense of horror. One of the things is in this, in this particular video, I am a very, very lucky person. I am not going to tell you lots and lots of stories about combat in Ashau because I am one of the very, very lucky ones. I did not see a lot of combat in Ashau Valley. And I am very, very grateful for that experience. But I'm also, I want, I want my friends out there to understand, I'm also very, very, very lucky. However, there are some things in Ashau that I experienced that I think would be very, very interesting for people to, to know. Now, one of the first feelings I got in Ashau, one of the first operations we went on out there, this is, I'm, I'm talking about the time now of uh, between uh, June 1968 and uh, the first part of May 1969. That's when I served as, uh, I was serving as senior battalion advisor, the third battalion, second regiment, first Arvin division uh, infantry. So I was a senior battalion advisor. And during this tour, I worked 24 seven with the South Vietnamese army. Okay, I lived with them, I ate with them. I spoke Vietnamese 100% of the time with them. Sometimes toss in a little French and a little Chinese just for just for fun. But I lived with, I lived with the South Vietnamese Army during this time. Now, when we first went out into Ashau, the first thing that hits you about the place, it was in the summertime in the heat. The heat is just horrible. And those hills, those hills out there are just plain hell. You you I want I want you to try to visualize double and triple canopy jungle. And I want you to picture what it's like walking on in when vines are trapping your feet and you can't hardly move. And the sawgrass in there, I for many years after uh, Vietnam, I had scars all over my arms from the sawgrass cuts that I got uh, from, from Ash out and in, in, in time in the field. In other words, my, my arms would be completely tanned except for these large patches of white that would be from the cuts that I'd received on my arm from, from walking in ash out in the sawgrass and places like that. And, and, but it was the heat with the heat was horrible. So anyway, one of the, one of the first impressions I got is, is on one time we're climbing the way you climb hills at Ashau, a, a lot of times, you just don't walk up them. You you put your arm over your, you have to put your, reach out your arm, you wrap your arm around about a tree in front of you, and you haul yourself up, and then you grab another vine or another tree, and then you haul yourself up. And of course, if it's if it's raining and the and and the ground is totally wet, your feet are going, you know, sliding all over the place, and you're you're trying to hold on to the trees, you know, to walk up the side of the mountain because that's the way you climb the, the mountains. 
Okay, and then you've got your pack and your ammunition. And of course, your rifle is always in your way, you know, kind of thing. So you got to learn how to carry your rifle a special way and, and all that. My feeling about Ashow was kind of I, one of the first operations we went on out there. One day we're out there and we're climbing this hill. And I look off this, this steep, steep hill down into a very, very deep ravine. And in that deep, deep ravine, I saw a U.S. Army helicopter. I had to get down there to see and check it out because were there any bodies? Was there anybody in there or, or, or what? So because the helicopter looked like it was actually in pretty good shape. I mean, it was uh, when I got down there, I saw a lot of bullet holes in it, but but it, it, it still had its structure. So anyway, my Vietnamese, my Vietnamese friends, comrades uh, helped me with a rope down there. And I got down there with my uh, with my sergeant and uh, we checked it out. No bodies, but in there, there was a, a C ration box. And on the C ration box were uh, inscribed in big letters, heading south. And I thought, you poor bastards, you poor, poor bastards. Because heading south like that, and I don't know what kind of shape they were in. Were they wounded? Were they, were they hit? Were they hurt? I don't know what kind of shape they were in. I mean, we don't know anything. All I, know, all I saw was there was heading south. If they were lucky, what they would do is they would run into a group of North Vietnamese who would just simply shoot them where they stood. That's if they're lucky. If they were unlucky, they would die horribly in some ravine someplace, dehydrated, starved, and with millions and millions of red ants eaten on their bodies, along with perhaps some wild pigs. Wild pigs in that area ate human flesh. And also there were there were actually tigers in the area. One of the one of the great stories, another great story of that area was the uh, it was in the Stars and Stripes. Uh, there a company of Marines was out in Ashow. And one of the uh, one of the Marines woke up and when when he felt somebody was dragging him by his foot and it turned out to be a tiger. He and the tiger had a great to do and and the Marines around him couldn't shoot the tiger because they shoot the Marine. So everybody had to jump on the tiger with their knives. And then finally, the tiger ran off and the Marine ended up with 63 stitches in him. Ashow was not a not was not a good place. I want to kind of emphasize the fact that Ashow was an emotion. Now that was exemplified in this movie called Hamburger Hill. And one of the things this movie did is it did capture the idea of Ashow as an emotion, not just merely a location. Now, another book that I want to point out that is just marvelous, marvelous, and that is this book. Ashow Valor by Colonel Tom Yarborough. Now, Colonel Yarborough, uh, he wrote another book, which is very, very great, also called His Experiences as a Forward Air Controller. And this book is a uh, uh, Da Nang Diary. This is also by Colonel Tom Yarborough. Now, Colonel Yarborough had he his book on Ashow, I don't know how he did it, but he was a forward air controller, and I want to tell our friends out there that I respect these guys so much. These people saved my life on numerous occasions. They were brave beyond belief, and they were so knowledgeable and so helpful. So I want to pay my respects now to Colonel Tom Yarborough and his magnificent comrades. But Colonel uh, Yarborough in his book, I Shall Valor, captures the essence of I Shall because he gets in, he calls it the Valley of Death. And he really, he really gets into the theme of the Valley of Death because that's exactly what it was. And he wants to point out how the North Vietnamese Army basically owned it. They had so much anti-aircraft in there. They had so much, they, they had so much anti-aircraft uh, capabilities. They were taking down aircraft all the time. It, it was, a lot of artillery was going in there. Uh, 
the, it, it, the place just was filled with the North Vietnamese Army. Another thing that I kind of want to point out is that I spent basically, I'm going to estimate three months walking Ashau. Now, I walked a lot of places in Ashau. Fortunately, for some reason, the North Vietnamese did not feel like they wanted to take us on or they just ignored us or whatever. So I'm, like I say, I'm one of the lucky ones. I saw some combat, but not, not a lot. Uh, we'd run across some North Vietnamese reconnaissance patrols and we'd, we'd shoot maybe four or five of them every once in a while. So we did some of that, but that's not what I would call heavy combat. One of the things that I, I want to convey to the my friends out there is that how much the North Vietnamese Army did own Ashau. I'll never forget one time when I was, again, we're walking Ashau, and I'm coming down off a mountain this time, and all of a sudden I slip and I fall, and I roll and roll and roll down, and the next thing I know, I'm in a ditch, and I'm on a ditch beside a road. And this road is in the middle of Ashau Valley. And it's a very nice road. It's dirt, but it's a kind of a compact. It, it's, I think it was a clay-like dirt that, that was peculiar to uh, Ashau. I'm not sure, but it was a beautiful road. And on both sides of the road were ditches for the water to go down to. And all along the road, there were these, uh, there were foxholes, places where when the bombers came or whatever, uh, the, the North Vietnamese army could be in there. But it was a beautiful, beautiful road. And over the top of the road, all the trees were interlaced so that it couldn't be seen from the air. Now, I ran across a couple of those roads, but let me tell you what happened when I, I saw this road. I reported the road uh, to, my, to my regimental senior advisor, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Donald E. Parsons. The answer I got back from uh, Colonel Parsons was, is the Marines do not believe you. I reported the road, but the Marines do not believe you. And at that point, I was, of course, in a state of absolute rage that anybody would deny my word. Remember, I'm only 27 years old or 28 at 27, 28 during this time. So I'm still a young, I'm a young captain. And I was just enraged that they wouldn't believe me. But now at age 83, I have a different take on it. One of the things that has come out over the years is how delusional our senior staff, senior officers, and everybody was about the actual on the ground realities of Vietnam. Now this is an on the ground reality, a road. And this road is a very, very nice road. I mean, trucks can go on it. I mean, it, it's, it, it was a nice road. And it was in the middle of Ashau, pointing right. And Ashau's close to way. I mean, that should have been something that's important. And I ran across one or two other roads like that along the way. That, that should be a matter of important. But no, no, it doesn't exist. Because the mentality of that era was, is we're winning the war and we don't want anything to, we don't want any facts to interfere with this dream world that we're living in. And remember now, my friends, I'm talking 1968, 1969. This is after Tet. Tet should have been a huge, huge wake up call for the whole institution, but no, the dream world goes on. The delusional dream world, it doesn't exist. Now, I also ran across another engineer officer during my time there. And this engineer officer, he was out on an operation one time in Ashau. And on top of one of the mountains in Ashau, he found a Chinese bulldozer. A Chinese bulldozer on top of a mountaintop in Ashau. And when he called it in, they wouldn't believe him either. So he told me what he did was, is he got helicopters in, dismantled the bulldozer part by part, 
put it together again, and he he claimed that he drove it to the to the divi- the forward division uh, command post at the uh, landing zone of uh, uh, Vanderbilt, or it used to be called landing zone stud or Kalu. You could call it any of those three names. Now, I don't know whether that's a fact and whether that young officer did that or not, but there's no reason for him to lie to me. But he was just in a state of rage like I was. So for me, everything just makes, you know, on our on our feelings. But he had the wherewithal, the ability to get that bulldozer out of there and then drive it up there. And, you know, I, this came from the top of a mountaintop in, in Ashout. This 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 was the kind of thing that we were always experiencing in in, in Ashau. Another thing that we experienced in Ashau was when we were, we walk and walk and walk. Now the incident I'm going to report now on, it didn't occur in in combat, but it showed what the North Vietnamese Army was capable of. We were on what was called Mobile Battalion, and for about Six weeks, this was another time we were in Ashau. Uh, six, we just walked Ashau, and again, it wasn't, we didn't, we didn't make much contact. Some contact, but not much. Uh, so after the end of six weeks, it's time for us to go. So there we are on the Laotian border. We're calling in the helicopters. The helicopters are coming in. And as the helicopters come in, one of the reconnaissance helicopters says, Junkie Sprays Delta, that's my call sign. That was my call sign at that time, Junkie Sprays Delta. He said, I see there's a convoy, there's truck tracks of a convoy going through your position. I said, no way. He said, these are fresh truck tracks. He said, I I can see fresh truck tracks. And he said, they're going through your position. And he said, "They're, they're not more than a day old. And of course, okay, I want, I want my friends to understand one thing. This is my personal laziness. And so I'm, I'm not happy about reporting personal laziness, but I will. Six weeks at Ashau, and all I can think about is getting back to the regimental headquarters and a cold beer. That's what I want. Okay. So I'm sitting there talking to the, the helicopter reconnaissance. Truck tracks? How could there be truck tracks? I was my 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 sergeant and I, hip and steel, and I were we were here all night long. We were sleeping on the track that we're on. We were on a, a kind of a track. We were sleeping on it. So how could a truck convoy come through? So anyway, we get back to we get back to the regimental headquarters, and uh, my battalion commander. By this time, I was very very into my battalion. They were my comrades. They were my friends but I never trusted them. I never, ever trust. I loved them, but I never, ever trusted them because they all wanted to live. And you can never trust a soldier who wants to live because that will become the most important thing. My Sergeant Hip and Steel, we had spies in each one of the companies and the spies would, we would pay them a monthly fee and then they would tell us what's really going on in our, our battalion. Uh, because my counterpart would lie to me, and of course, sometimes I'd lie to him. But I wanted to know what the truth was. So anyway, we paid out money to the spies, and the spies came in and reported, yes, in fact, there was a truck convoy that did go through our position that night headed to the north. And it was silent because elephants were leading the trucks through the, the site where we were sleeping. So they were very quiet. Our spies reported that the uh, a North Vietnamese officer had uh, taken a white flag, come up through the lines, and uh, said to our battalion commander, do you want a big fight now or let us through? All we want to do is we, we've got a, a large uh, convoy here of ammunition, uh, mostly uh, mortar rounds, artillery rounds, and all we're going to do is kill Marines in the North. And of course, my battalion commander, he's, he's okay with that. So kill some Marines. Okay, that's, we're not going to kill North Viet or South Vietnamese soldiers. We're going to go for the Marines. Okay. This was something I had to, of course, report to my, my regimental senior advisor. But remember, this time is kind of tricky because we can't just pick up the phone and call a general and say, this is what's going on. Because remember, 
the party line is the Vietnamese are winning the war and these are our trusted comrades. And so if we report something like that to a real higher authority, we're going to be in big trouble because it's not part of the party line. Okay. So anyway, I have, but I have to report this because those Marines have to know what's coming. They have to know this. So I get a hold of Colonel Parsons and I'll never forget this as long as I live. Colonel Parsons was, he, he later got killed and I'll describe that because he got killed at Ash Out. He was the, one of the bravest, most honorable officers and gentlemen that I have ever, ever served with. Bravest, a gentleman beyond belief. And I, I loved him and I respected him so deeply. But I walked over to him and I told him, I said, look, sir, this is, this is the straight scoop. You know, this is what happened. And all of a sudden, he, he just, he sat down and began to cry. And all, and, and all he could do is just say, Captain Horton, what are, who are these people? What kind of people are they? What, what kind of people are they? Why are we here? And I mean, he was just breaking down and, and sobbing. And I put my, as a captain, I didn't know what to do, but I let, I really loved, I put my arms around the guy and I said, look, sir, at this point, I wasn't enraged because I'd lived with the Vietnamese for a long time now. And I understood, I understood they wanted to live. And, and, and so I said, sir, they, they just want to live. And, and, and this is, this is what happened. So I, I didn't approve. Of course, I didn't approve of this as a professional soldier. How can you approve of something like this? But on the other hand, I understood it. And I couldn't hate what I could understand. So I was in the strange position as a, as a young captain to, to comfort my, my, my senior officer. And then but I said, sir, we, we've got to do something about this. And, and, and Colonel Parsons, he was a very, he was a great operator. And he said, he said, I'll take care of it. And so I knew that the Marines would be notified. And, and so I, I knew, I knew he'd take care of it in the, in, in the right way. But this is not quite the end of the story because I went back to have, have that beer uh, with, uh, with, with my sergeant. And now I want to talk a little bit about my sergeant, Sergeant First Class Thomas Hippensteel. He is a person I always call Hip, and he retired out as the sergeant major. I visited him three times in the United States. We got together, and I talked to him three days before he died. And, and I was able to tell him on numerous occasions that I just loved and respected the ground he walked on because he was my brother. He was my comrade. This is the kind of relationship I had with, with Tom Hippensteel, uh, my sergeant. I was always captain to him till e even our last conversation three days before he died, he was still calling me captain. And I, and I, and I always called him Hip. Hip looked at me. And one of the things about Hip was he was one of the bravest, but he was also one of the smartest and also one of the toughest sergeants I have ever seen in my life. I have never seen a braver, tougher, or smarter, smarter sergeant in my life. And Hip looked at me, and he said, uh, Captain, have you figured out why we're still alive? And I was kind of stunned. Uh, I, I, and then all of a sudden, boing. I got it. That North Vietnamese officer didn't come out of nowhere alone. At that time, we, he was talking with my, my counterpart. Our battalion undoubtedly was completely surrounded, probably by a North Vietnamese regiment. Because no officer, no North Vietnamese officer is going to pop out of nowhere. We were surrounded, and if if he had dropped that that flag of truce, we'd have been wiped out. Now, 
the North Vietnamese, they fought when they wanted to fight. They didn't necessarily fight when we wanted to fight. They fought when they wanted to fight. Now, they had a truck convoy that had to go north. So they didn't feel like wiping us out at that time. And also another problem for them would have been is they knew that they had there were advisors with that battalion, myself and, and, and him. And we could call in firepower like you can't believe, you know, from, from facts like uh, Colonel uh, Yarborough, bombs, napalm. We could call in artillery. We could call in Navy gunfire. We could call in the world, you know, kind of thing. And who knows? Maybe some of that napalm and some of those bombs would wipe out that convoy because napalm and convoys don't work very well together, okay? Artillery could have wiped it out. I mean, an accident could have happened. They didn't want that. And so they'd let us go. But at the same time, that convoy was going to get up there. So if they had to wipe us out to do it, they'd do it. But we were just a blip at that time to their main mission. Now think about the organization that that entails. That convoy with all that ammunition coming down from China, North Vietnam, along those Ho Chi Minh trails. And then they had elephants ready to go Elephants by the Hill Tribe people there. And the Hill Tribe people were very, very good with the elephants. So they had their own Hill Tribe people. So they had that kind of organization. Think about that organization. What kind of organization could do that? That was incredible. And build those roads and, and do, do what that was. I mean, I, I, I looked at him and I said, I can't believe how stupid I really, really was about this. You know, I mean, first of all, my first big mistake was is not to trust the helicopter coming over just simply because I wanted a cold beer, you know, at the time. And the second thing was, is that I didn't get the main point until Hip pointed it out to me. This story did not have a happy ending because a few weeks later, we're back on Alpha One. And like I said, I have a very close relationship with my battalion commander. And he sent a radio man over. And our battalion could do all kinds of things on radio. They could do things. They were into the North Vietnamese. They could, they could, they, at some time, sometimes they were into even monitoring the Laotian army, you know, with the, with the French, because we had people who could speak French in the battalion. Uh, my battalion had been a French battalion before. So all the officers and NCOs could speak French. The radio men from the battalion commander came over and he said, he said, Dai we or Captain. Tag Commander said he thought you'd, you'd, you'd want to listen to this. And what I was listening to was the screams of Marines on an outpost going down. One of the outposts, it was a couple thousand rounds of mortar rounds, a couple thousand mortar rounds in on top of Marine position, followed by the North Vietnamese Army. and the Marines were in there yelling and screaming and they were going down hard, but they were going down. And then it was all quiet and all I could hear was some Vietnamese chatter. There were a number of outposts down, you know, after that, that went down. Life in Ashau was a very, very brutal affair. Very, very, very brutal. And combat in that area was very, very, very brutal. I think the Americans were not conscious. In America, people weren't conscious of Ashau Valley in the way they were in Vietnam. But where the consciousness of Ashau came was Hamburger Hill, you know, the, the movie thing I just showed you. There are actually historians that do believe that Hamburger Hill was almost akin to the Tet 1968. Uh, as far as Americans turning against the war. It was on a TV every night. Those brave, brave men from the 101st Airborne, 11 times they went up Hamburger Hill before they actually took the top. And then one of the things that happened, and this is what the historians, some historians uh, uh, comment on, is the 
the Army did it an incredibly stupid thing after that, from a public relations point of view, is about a week after all of those dead taken Hamburger Hill, the 101st Airborne just evacuated the whole thing. And a couple a day or two later, the North Vietnamese were back on top of Hamburger Hill, and they never left. That was an absolute disaster. And of course, Senator Edward Kennedy and a lot of other politicians really jumped on that. America at that time just went kind of crazy. Like I say, there are, there are historians that say the second cause of the American defeat in Vietnam was the publicity that took place after Hamburger Hill with all the politicians jumping in. And I was in Ashow from January the 28th to March the 7th. Now, this was not walking for me, but I was part of a forward command post for the South, uh, for our regiment, for the 2nd Regiment. Now, at this time, I didn't have HIP with me. I had another Sergeant First Class with me, Sergeant First Class Alfred Edwards. Alfred G. Edwards, I remember, Alfred G. Edwards, a great soldier, great, great soldier. Now, one of the first things I knew about uh, Sergeant First Class uh, Edwards was, is he's one of the very, very few Army sergeants I know that has the Soldier's Medal. Because uh, I, I, was at, I was on Alpha One in June 1968, when the North Vietnamese artillery, they, they bombed uh, Dong Ha and they took out all the munitions, all the munitions, all the artillery, everything, all the ammo dump, and Dong Ha just totally exploded, went off, and it looked like the atomic bomb. In that incredible, credible level of devastation, Sergeant First Class Edwards, he ran into that ammo dump that was exploding all around him, his his major, his senior advisor was a major, army major, and one of the Vietnamese workers, he picked up his major under one arm and he picked up the Vietnamese under another arm and, and ran into there, picked them up, ran out with them. Now, this was just an incredible guy. So here I am in Ashow, and I have 11 Marines with me also because we're support, they're supporting the operation. I don't know where in Ashow Valley we were. I looked over my letters to my mother and I got the dates, January 28th to March the 7th, but I don't have the location, but we are on a hill. It's near the Laotian border someplace. So that's all I can say. It was on a huge hill in next to the Laotian border in Ashow. And I have 11 Marines with me. Uh, four of them are from... Uh, a communications outfit to set up the communications for the thing. Uh, I have, uh, let's see, I have uh, three engineers uh, to blow the, uh, they had to blow the uh, uh, place for the landing zone. So they had to blow the trees out of there. And then I had two that from the helicopter support uh, unit there. Uh, so I had all together, I had 11 Marines, uh, one army, Sergeant First Class and myself. And then there were the Vietnamese. So there we were in Ashow. First couple of days, okay. And then the fog comes in. Now, this is one of the things that I want to talk about. The fog in Ashow is unbelievable. You literally cannot see your hand in front of your face. Literally. I, I mean that. That's not metaphorically. I mean that as a literal statement. You cannot see your hand in front of your face. When you get socked in like this, and we were socked in for 10 days, we had no food for about eight or nine days. Now the food situation is bad, but what's really worse was is we had no batteries for our radios. So how do you communicate? So what we, what we had to do was is every day we had to limit our conversations on the radio to just like maybe a, a, a couple of minutes a day. It was a real tough go. Now, what we did was, is we, uh, we lived on some tubers. They had, I, I'm not sure, I'm not sure what it is. It's some kind of taro, but, but it, it came, it was up there in the mountains. It's some kind of taro 
and the Vietnamese soldiers that they some some of them were farm boys, and so they they could go out and pick up the taro, and so we we had little bulbs of taro that we roast on the fire, and then uh, water. Uh, fortunately, we had water. There was a stream way way down the hill, so we just have you know we'd have people go down and get water for us. But th fortunately, there's a stream there. But we basically we had nothing to eat for about seven days. So it was, uh, it was, it was, but that wasn't even the worst part of that. Uh, about third or fourth day, the, uh, my, my, my regimental senior advisor, uh, he, he'd been to, in Hawaii and on his first day back, he found out what our situation was like in, in Ashau and he got on a black cat helicopter. It was black cat, black cat 88, black cat 88. This is from the 282nd uh, Aviation Helicopter Support Company. And these were my heroes. I worship the ground these guys walked on. They were heroes to me. And so he got on a helicopter with a lot of food, came out, contacted me. And I told him, I said, sir, please don't come in here. Please don't, because you're not going to make it. And these hills around here, you're just not going to make it. And and he said, well, he said, I'm I'm looking at, he said, this is an awful lot of fog. And, and he said, I said, sir, please don't. He said, okay, I guess I won't. And then that was the last I heard from him. And then they called back, where is he? And I said, I have no idea. And he went down. He He crashed. Black Cat 88 went out and all everybody aboard was killed. Their remains weren't found until the year 2000. So there, there it was. The bravest, the bravest man, one of the bravest men I ever met in my life. And same thing with Black Cat. Black Cat 88, the people too, brave beyond belief. But that's what Ashow did. Ashow killed. When, when Colonel Yarborough writes, it's the valley of death, it was the valley of death. It was. Now, another thing that came in, another caused me a little worry, was I got a, I got a radio message from uh, my headquarters, uh, 2nd Regiment. And they said, look, it seems like we've got intelligence. There's a North Vietnamese regiment that's coming into your location. It looks like they're coming for you a North Vietnamese regiment. So, and I'm on top of this hill with a group of very, very frightened South Vietnamese. The, the officer that's involved that I'm, that I'm working with is, I'll just let it go with not really suitable for the job at hand, okay? A North Vietnamese regiment coming in. And I said, okay. So, uh, I told the 11, I told the nine Marines I had with me, I said, look, it's like this. It looks, seems like there's a North Vietnamese regiment headed our way. Now, we're in a position, we're going to call in lots and lots of artillery. The artillery could come, but there'll be no air support. No air can come through. So it'll be artillery, maybe some long-term mortars or something like that, but that's all we can get. So I said, we're going to go down. The North Vietnamese are not going to take any prisoners. They can't. I mean, it, this is not this is not something that's that's bad necessarily, but they can't. They have a hard time feeding their own people. They're not going to take care of us. So I said, we should just basically consider ourselves dead already. And and the Marines were okay with that. Uh, it, it looks we're. We're going to go down hard, sir. We're Marines and we're going to go down hard. So we got the engineers out there putting claymores into the trees and we started digging holes and, and you know, getting all of our ammo and everything ready. And then, uh, and, and I have to say, I have never, ever been more impressed with Marines in my life than I was with those nine Marines. They were just the greatest. I got a phone call or I got a, I got a call, not a phone call. I got, I got a call on the radio. And this is one thing I'll never, ever forget as long as I live. There was a unit, and I don't know what this unit was. 
but there was a, there was a, I heard a voice on the line, Junkie Sprays Delta. And I said, yes, this is Dimmer 6. Now, I don't know who Dimmer 6 is, but the 6 indicates it's the commanding officer. So 6 means commanding officer, but what Dimmer 6 is, I understand. He said, I am monitoring your situation. And he said, I want you to know that no matter what the fog is, no matter what the weather is, he said, we're going to come and get you. I, I just told him, I said, sir, you, you, you can't do that. You know, you, you just can't do that because you have no idea what what the terrain around here is like. You know, and, and the fog, I said, sir, you don't have a chance. He said, junkie sprays Delta. We are going to come and get you. Now, just understand that, and we're going to keep monitoring the situation. Now, that to me was an act of gallantry. I I have never, ever forgotten. Now, I think Dimmer 6, and I'm guessing that Dimmer 6 was a unit in the 101st Airborne. But thank goodness, no North Vietnamese regiment showed up. When the sun finally broke through on about the 11th day, we got uh, an air delivery of food and batteries. And so we were, we, were, we were basically okay after that. And then the operation went on until March the 7th. But my beloved boss, Lieutenant Colonel Donald E. Parsons, United States Army, was killed on February the 6th, February the 6th, 1969. One of the things I wanna leave, I wanna leave my friends with is this. I want to mention how lucky I am because I didn't see it. I didn't see much combat in Ashow, and I'm pretty grateful for that. But I do want to note the gallantry and the incredible courage of the United States Marines and the United States Army that was there. And also, I want our friends to understand how well organized our enemy was. People have no concept of how organized those Ho Chi Minh trails were. They had the elephants ready, the elephant trainers there. They had the organization. It was all there. And I don't want anybody to forget about delusion. One of the, one of the things that I, I learned over and over again, the infinite capacity of senior leadership to make wishing will make it so, their mantra, and to ignore the facts on the ground. War is objective and war is facts on the ground. And the battlefield doesn't care about your feelings. It doesn't care about your wishes. It doesn't care about your dreams. It doesn't care whether you live or die. It cares about nothing. It is. And you have to learn to live in that isness, okay, which is objective. And I will say goodbye to my friends for right now.